Hi, Congressman. Thanks for going on. We're going to get to tonight's debate in a moment, but first, there's been a lot of action on Capitol Hill today. Uh, let's start with spending. Yeah. Conservative GOP hardliners, they, they staged this. You could call it a rebellion on the House floor, taking down a procedural vote to show opposition to that spending deal. How long will conservatives keep the House in the state of paralysis? Well, look, this all depends. I mean, I wouldn't call it a state of paralysis. I mean, we're supposed to come up here and debate and deliberate. And uh, we but had now legislation can't move uh, forward because of the... the yeah. Well, we're looking for the right legislation to move forward, not just any legislation. And right now, we want to see bills moving forward that are going to actually cut spending like we said we would do. And a $1.66 trillion monstrosity, that's not what we signed up for. So we kind of body checked the, the conference a little bit and said, hey, let's get back in here. Let's get in the room. Let's go figure out what we need to do. Look, we're all in generally agreement, and same page of what we need to do. You have a razor thin majority. It's tough sledding. Uh, we got to go negotiate against the Senate and a White House that has no interest in constraining spending. They have no interest in adhering to the agreement that was bipartisan at 1.59. They want all the special side deals and the backroom deals. So, you know, we want to try to adhere to that, get it done, uh, cut spending. If we just do a CR for the rest of the year, funding through the rest of this year through September, we will spend at $1.564 trillion, $100 billion less than this. We will restore some order. Defense will be okay. Veterans will be okay. And we'll reduce the bureaucracy in this country. Most Americans want us to do that. Mike Johnson, for his part, um, he was just on Fox saying, look, I agree with Chip Roy. I'm not particularly thrilled about this deal, but the bottom line is this is a divided government. As you just said, yeah. there is a very slim majority in the House. You've got a Democrat-controlled Senate, a Democratic president. This is just kind of what you have to do to get the deal done. Um, what do you say to that? Yeah, I think you should take the House majority for a bit of a spin and uh, go over to uh, Senator Schumer, the president, and say, look, I mean, we control the power of the purse. Uh, we had an agreement, a bipartisan agreement. It was signed, uh, and the president signed it into law, puts caps into place, adhere to the caps. I mean, I look, and it was by a majority of, of Republicans and Democrats. So we just adhere to the caps. We'll get to the spending restraint that we should put in place, and we can move forward. And I think that's what we ought to do. And if they want to shut down the government, that's on them. Look, by the way, this well, is no, a... It's, this, it's on, it's on, it's not uh, on them. It's, it's on uh, it's on you and the other hardliners, uh, no, no, uh, Republican no. oh, wait, hardliners wait, wait, who are standing why? in the way of why this. Is it, why would it be on us? Well, why Johnson would it be on has us already announced the top lines for the spending, a potential spending deal with Democrats. I mean, right, there's which, already been. So right, which is a violation of the agreement. So why would it be on us? Well, they would be would the ones say, choosing to shut down. They would say no. And by the way, no, this would be G this would be on GOP hardliners if the government shuts down. No, why? Because what because we said is there's an agreement from last year. We should stick to it. Like the whole point well, here is. And, and if Speaker you're Johnson act, would say we are sticking to it. And I've gotten $16 billion in extra spending cuts and $30 billion total from what Democrats wanted initially. And we are sticking to, to the deal that was struck. What do you it's, say to that? It, it's not. It's $1.66 trillion using a bunch of side deals and gimmicks to expand the size of the government well over the omnibus spending bills of last year. And look, let's be very clear. Uh, this is a big give for me to say that I would even sit down and consider that when the Texas border is wide open. I want to see our border secure first. So for me to sit down and say, look, I'll consider a CR through the end of the year that would adhere to the caps so we can govern in this divided government, uh, that's actually a give on my part because Texas is under assault by a recalcitrant administration and a Secretary of Homeland Security who was thankfully grilled today by Mark Green for lying to me under oath while people get assaulted in Texas. And, and we're going to talk more about the border later on, but, but I want to ask you before we get to that, you have openly flirted with this idea of making a motion to vacate your new speaker, Mike Johnson, as we talk about. He makes spending, if he makes a spending deal that isn't tough enough on the border and like what you've laid out, is his job in jeopardy today? And what I've said is that everything's always on the table. I mean, that's the whole point of having rules so that you can be able to hold the body to account. Uh, nothing should be off the table. I, but by the way, as you know, I was not itching to move the motion to vacate in the fall. I was opposed to that move. I didn't agree with it. I don't want to do it here. Mike's a friend. What I want the Republican conference to do is stand up and fight. Actually do what we said we would do. And that's what I want to see out of this. And so, look, everything should be on the table today. We took down a rule uh, saying, look, guys, let's sit down, do our job, spend at the level we're supposed to. The people I represent, they want us to cut spending, secure the border. That's what we need to do. All right, let's talk about that very quickly. I want to ask you about this impeachment hearing today for Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas over yeah. his handling of the border crisis. Uh, you had legal expert uh, Jonathan Turley, who has been a GOP witness in the Biden probe, frequently cited by conservatives. He wrote, quote, no current evidence, there is no current evidence that he is corrupt or committed an impeachable offense. He could be legitimately accused of effectuating an open border policy, but that is a disagreement on policy that is traced to the president. He also says this could set a dangerous precedent by impeaching cabinet members that you don't like because of policy disagreements. Are you concerned or setting a troubling precedent here? 
Yeah, no, first of all, I mean, I'd like to see his specific definition of what rises to the level of impeachment, right? That is something that's debated over time memoriam. The fact is, is when you violate your oath, when you do not take care to see that the laws are faithfully executed, when in fact you have American citizens who are getting harmed, you have people dying from fentanyl poisonings, you have wide open borders that are empowering cartels and empowering China, that is a blatant disregard of his duty. And importantly, he did, in fact, lie to me under oath when I presented him with the statute that says that you're supposed to maintain operational control of the border. He said one thing to me in a Judiciary Committee, went to another committee and went over to the Senate and said totally different things. And that actually matters because he was trying to tell the American people that they were, in fact, having operational control of the border, and they didn't. And he was using the language to try to skirt around it. I pressed him on it. Mark Green did a great job at Homeland Security today demonstrating that, in fact, he did lie to us under oath. All right, so, so I want to just pick apart a little bit of what you said, because some of, some of what you said, DHS has come back and said, look, no laws have been violated here. You know, this has been a, continuum, a continuing issue, fentanyl poisonings <clears throat> coming across the border, so forth, and that they say they've done more to combat the fentanyl coming, fentanyl coming across the border in the last two years and the last five years prior to that. That is what DHS is saying. And I, I actually even spoke to a former Trump administration DHS official today um, who says, look, I don't like the way the border is being run by the Biden administration. I disagree with it, but it would be more productive to work on policy enhancements than waste time with an impeachment. What do you say to that? Well, number one, uh, we are working on policy enhancements. That's why we passed H.R. 2, the best border security bill that we've ever passed on the House floor. It is sitting over in the Senate and languishing because the Senate Democrats and the president don't want to secure the border. But also well, with, with respect they, to They fentanyl, say they have a supplemental that, that, they, that they have proposed with more funding for border patrol agents and so forth. Um, right. They want more funding so they can process more people. They don't want to actually have the laws in place to allow us to actually secure the border. And in fact, we do have laws in place right now, which they are blatantly ignoring. And the fact of the matter is that when they want to they talk say, about fentanyl... And of course, the White House says no laws are being ignored. This is about <clears throat> policy disagreements. But I want yeah. to make sure we... we I tell you what, I tell you what, I will send you the Secure Fence Act chart that I put up in front of Alejandro Mayorkas. You read it and you tell me if they're violating the laws. It's plain black letter text and he's violating the law. And by the way, about fentanyl, six kids in the school district in which my family resides die from fentanyl poisonings last year. So for those who are Which saying, oh, look at us, oh, look at us, we're doing and so much no better on fentanyl. Said, no one they says come that down. that's still not an issue. I want that's Alejandro Mayorkas to White come down said. and talk to my kid, the, the, kid, the parents of those children and look them in the eye and say, I'm doing everything I can to stop fentanyl pouring into the communities that are killing Texans. But we you have to admit it's also poured in under Republican administrations too, correct? At, at much smaller numbers. And by the way, the number of people coming across the border in, at the end of the Trump administration because of Remain in Mexico and because of Title 42 was far lower, like 30,000 a month. We had 302,000 people who were, who were apprehended in December. 302,000, and Mayorkas just went to the border. He admitted they're releasing 85% of them. That's according and, to Fox News, sources telling Fox News. Yeah, well, it's according I to the Border that. Patrol I agents I talked to. I called the Border Patrol agents. They said it was okay. more than 85%. That's the truth, and we know it, and okay. the evidence bears it out. All right, let me just ask before we go, because it is important to get your take on the debate. Of course, mm -hmm. you've been pushing for Ron DeSantis. Um, what do you want to see from him tonight? Oh, look, I just want to see the governor keep doing what he's been doing since I've been on the campaign trail with him. And as long as that he's been in office, that's standing up for the people that he represents. He's done a phenomenal job. There's a lot of enthusiasm, a lot of energy. He's on the right trajectory. Uh, with all due respect, Governor Haley's been stumbling. It's hardly been a day over the last two weeks where there hasn't been a gaffe where she's, you know, basically mocking the people of Iowa, saying the people of New Hampshire need to correct Iowans. Uh, I think we'll see tonight in the debate uh, some pretty good exchanges. And look, I I'd love to see him ask her about Boeing. While she was sitting on the board of Boeing and they were giving out, you know, stock buybacks, uh, what was going on making sure that, you know, bolts aren't missing and that we don't have plane windows blowing out? Look, we need to restore American manufacturing. We need leadership. We don't need people who are more interested in corporate cronyism than holding corporations accountable and standing up for the little guys out there who want to get by in life, dying from Biden inflation, dying from the fact that we have all these EV mandates and all these regulations that's killing them. We need somebody who can lead in office, and that's, that's Governor DeSantis. He's been knocking it out on the campaign trail in Iowa. I look forward to joining him again uh, probably on Friday. I'm not sure. It depends on what we're doing here. But the bottom line is he, he's not pulling so well when you look at like New Hampshire, and if he doesn't win Iowa, he's put all, all of his, his eggs in that basket. If he doesn't win Iowa, you think it's over for him or no? I mean, Nikki Haley's making up a lot of ground, especially in New Hampshire. I think only seven points behind Trump. 
Well, we'll see when the people go into the voter booth and they make a decision. I mean, right now we know on the ground there's a lot of enthusiasm for Iowa. We have 1,600 uh, captains, precinct captains who are enthused. We were talking to him on the phone the other day. Casey and I were driving through southeast Iowa when the governor had to go back to Florida for the state of the state. They're enthusiastic. We have thousands of people who are, you know, engaged that have already signed their cards to caucus for the governor. Uh, look, what's on the ground is very different than what's in the polls, so I think we'll see that on Monday. All right, Republican Congressman Chip Roy, thank you for your time. I appreciate you coming on. Thanks, ma'am. God bless.